Hello and welcome to my first stream. Uh, my name is Shauna. I am a certified dog trainer and this is the first class of a three series pre-puppy class. Um, this class is going to be done online through Twitch and is going to teach you all about how to raise and care for a puppy. Um, now I have a little puppy guest here with us. It's her first time in the room, so she'll be on and off camera. Um, all right, let me see what I'm doing here. Um, okay, so this is pre-puppy. I'm still getting used to this program too, so just bear with me if it's a little bit wonky. I don't want that anymore. And that's backwards. Let's do that. All right. All right. Um. All right, so everything you need to know about caring for a puppy. So this course is designed for owners who, new owners, who um, are just getting to know everything they need to know um, before getting their puppy. So really it's designed um, before, for, before you have a puppy. However, all the knowledge will still be um, useful for you as you have your new puppy. Okay, let me just see if this works does. All right, so these are all the things that we're going to cover throughout the three-week period. Um, this course will be run um, every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for the next three Wednesday. well, this Wednesday and then two more. Um, so throughout this course, we're going to go over um, leadership, uh, what that is and what it means for your relationship with your puppy. We're going to go over energy and exercise requirements for your puppy. Uh, we're going to talk about positive reinforcement training, how it's done, what it is, and why it's important. Um, we're going to talk about socialization and desensitization, what those really mean, um, why they're important. Um, we're going to talk about puppy manners and how to teach your puppy to have really good house manners, crate training and enforced naps and why those are important, um, potty training, the big one, we're going to talk about how potty training is done and some tips and tricks. We'll talk about problem behaviors um, such as nipping um, and jumping up and that kind of thing. We will also talk about the health and safety of your puppy and a lot more. Now throughout this course, you can also ask any questions throughout. Um, they're more than welcome and we can do questions throughout the stream. All right, so that was what we're gonna cover over the three week period. Today we're gonna talk about um, how to establish leadership, um, what leadership is. We're gonna talk about the energy and exercise different breed groups and what requirements they may have, um, puppy education, socialization, desensitization, and we're going to touch on positive reinforcement training. All right, so first, let's talk about some myths that you may have encountered. Um, hold on here. Um, so a lot of times people have heard different things about how to raise and train a puppy. Um, some of these things include being the alpha and asserting your dominance over the dog. Um, now this kind of theory comes from wolves in the wild and how they're structured. Um, but dogs have been bred 
down from wolves. Oh, jeez. Hi there, are you there? <laughs> oh, right in my stream. I'm kind of busy right now, but yeah, I'm here. They were too busy to talk to me. I love you, honey. Say bye. I'll message you in an hour. <laughs> okay, anyways. Um. Oh, yeah, try. We might be going out, though. Uh, you can try it. Love you. <laughs> Jeepers. All right. Um, now, this is something that people, many people do believe. Uh, however, this is not the best way to form a relationship with your dog. Um, okay. Teaching through fear and intimidation. This has been something that has been around for many years. Um, positive reinforcement training has really taken dominance over that uh, because it is much more effective for the dog, but it also it creates a stronger bond with your dog and will create a dog that actually listens. Um, fear and intimidation can actually really damage uh, your dog emotionally, um, if not physically as well in some cases. So that is a big myth. And scolding your dog if you found that they've had an accident. This is a huge no-no for many reasons and uh, we can talk about that more as well. The main reason being if your dog, um, if you found that your dog has peed on the floor after the fact and then you scold them they're not going to connect the dots between the fact that they peed a couple hours ago and the fact that you're upset. They're going to connect that you came home, you're upset, and now whenever you come home, they're going to be afraid that maybe you might be upset with them. So it's really important that you don't scold them. If, even if you catch them in the act, because that can actually teach them um, to not go in front of you and they'll be afraid to go potty in front of you, which will make potty training even more difficult. So these are some myths that are very common and very untrue things regarding dog training, okay? Now, establishing leadership. Um, a leader is someone who is strong, dependable, consistent, non-confrontational, and fair. Um, these are, this is something really to keep in mind when training your puppy, um, because you want to be a leader for your dog, as that will really create a nice strong bond with your dog. Okay, leadership is important for a happy, healthy life, both dog and human. Now, this is because... The way that dogs have been bred over 30,000 years is to work with humans within their structure, their family hierarchy. Uh, so you want to be the leader for your dog and um, by doing so you will tell the dog that they don't have anything to worry about, which is what I'm going to get to next. but. Um, so as a leader, you are responsible for providing food, resting spots, treats, toys, walks, um, setting clear and consistent rules, and you're firm but fair. Now this doesn't mean that you are going to yell at your dog. It means that you are not, you're make, you, your rules that you make make sense to the dog. And... Uh, by making sense to your dog, you are actually just making it a lot easier for them to understand what it is that you want, which is really important. And um, yeah, so it tells your dog they have nothing to worry about. 
Um, so there are many ways that you can establish leadership. It's important to kind of understand what leadership entails. Um, to create that bond and leadership, there's many different exercises that you can do. Uh, I won't overwhelm you with all of them, but um, doing some training with your dog, um, giving them meal times, having all your meals, all their meals come from you, um, providing them with treats and training, um, rules, being consistent with your rules, and we'll talk more about consistency later on the course. Um, but these are all some things that will help to tell your dog that you are the leader and that you will take care of everything. Now this is a big one, energy and exercise. So there's two uh, things that you need to keep in mind with the exercise requirements and that is the physical and the mental needs. So physical, um, so for your puppy, as a puppy, um, five minutes per month of age, um, twice a day, that's a rule of thumb for how much exercise they should be getting. Um, there's a puppy. Um, it's really important that you stick to this and not exceed this, even if they seem like they can go for longer because as a puppy, they're still growing and you don't want to damage their growth at all or damage their muscles as they're, everything is still growing. So it's really important to stick to this rule of thumb as they're a puppy. Once they're an adult, um, vigorous exercise, so they pant heavily at least once per day, is the bare minimum that they will need. And this, the amount of time that it takes to reach that will be different depending on the breed of dog that you get and the, the individual as well. Um, some ways that you can um, expend this physical energy is through teaching fetch and agility. Um, these are both actually physically and mentally stimulating, which is great because you got a two for one there. Um, uh -oh. oh yeah. Um, now daycare, that's something that you may want to look into. Um, there are doggy daycares and you can bring your dog there for the day or for a few hours and they get to play with other dogs. Now the thing with this, um, you really want to do your research when you're looking into daycares because there are there really isn't any regulation for what it makes a doggy daycare and um, there are a lot of places out there unfortunately who care more about the money than the dog's well-being and they may be understaffed or their staff may be undertrained. Um, and so that is really important to keep in mind especially if you're going to bring a puppy who is under a year old to a daycare because during their first year of life they are very susceptible to have negative their negative any negative experience can stay with them for life so it's really important that you're careful with your the way that you're socializing your dog um, so yeah just make sure you're doing your research and before taking your dog to a daycare, make sure that um, others have said, you know, that their dogs have been do taken care of and that you can see the facility and understand how many dogs are allowed per staff member. Because um, that ratio is really important, especially, um, you yeah, know, to make sure that everything is under control. But I could go on about that. Let's just do your research about daycares. The next thing is dog parks. Now, many people love dog parks. I mean, dog parks are great because you can take your dog out in public, let them off leash, let them run around, and it's safe. But the thing with dog parks is that anybody can use a dog park, and you may not always be able to control what kind of experience your dog has. So same thing with the daycares. 
for that first year, uh, your dog is susceptible to, um, there's a few different fear phases that they're going to go through. Um, and they're still learning about the world and what's safe and what's not safe. So if they have a negative experience at a dog park, this could actually stay with them for life. And you can never really control what goes on at the dog park. And because of that, it's really, it's really iffy and I would really recommend that you don't take your puppy to the dog park until they are over a year old because then they're past their fear phases and by then you've done all their socialization and gotten them understanding uh, more about the world and that kind of thing. So that's really important to think about before you go to the dog park. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is the mental stimulation. This is just as important as the physical stimulation, um, especially for certain breeds. Certain breeds were bred to work more with, um, with their minds and <laughs> she's discovered the door stuff. <laughs> um, so it's really important to, hold on, let me just get her. Oh, she's done with it now. I was just going to grab the camera on her. Um, so anyway, so with mental stimulation, one way that you can, whoa, what have I done now? Hold on here. Hold on. Hold on. What is going, there we go. Puppies. Um, so one way that you can mentally stimulate the puppy is by letting them sniff on walks. And actually, sniffing is really informative for a dog. They have way more receptors than we do, and they're, um, sorry, um, they, it really works their mind when they can get latched onto a new scent. And there's so many scents out in the world. So when you let them sniff on walks, they're actually really working their minds, thinking about what these scents are. Um, training. Now this could be obedience training, trick training, um, any kind of training. It really works their mind and problem solving, um, like any kind of training that you can do is really good for their mental health. Puzzles. Um, now that, you can actually buy different kinds of puzzle toys. And I have a couple that I can show you here. Um, this one is a lot of fun if it's not going to fall apart. All right. So you can get puzzle toys like on Amazon or uh, at the pet store, wherever. This is one that I have. Um, uh, this one's really neat because these white things are locks for them. So you can unlock them and hope that they don't all just fall out everywhere. Okay. So then what your dog can do is kind of push these things to get the treats underneath. And if they get really good at that, then you can teach them how to unlock that. Now, I haven't been able to manage. Um, I've worked with this with my dog, and he hasn't quite figured out how to do the locking part yet. But um, it's definitely a good thing. Now, let me see here. I have this puppy. She is eight weeks old. And I'm going to see if she has any interest in trying this out for you guys. Okay, now, usually with treat toys, it may take a little while to actually train them how to do it. But what do you think of this? What do you think? There's treats there. Oh, yummy. Good girl. Okay, let me see if I can put a few more. Now. I'm just going to put a few there and see if she can um, show some interest there and give that a whirl. Um, this is a really cool puzzle toy because even once the dog learns how they work, they actually spend a lot of time on it. Um, like Todd has been using this, my dog Todd, he's been using this for a while. 
And still, when I give it to him, I'll give him a good five, ten minutes of activity. These things are also really great for puppies because um, they're always wanting to be up to something. So if you give them something appropriate that they can be doing, then that's less of a headache for you. She's already getting it. That's awesome. Good for her. Um, oh, what have I done? Oh, nothing. Okay. <laughs> um, so if you're just tuning in, uh, my name is Shauna. I'm a certified dog trainer. This is actually my first stream. And um, I'm planning on doing a weekly stream. This is a new kind of lesson that I've been working on called Pre-Puppy. Um, it's designed for owners who don't yet have a puppy to get them prepared for what the raising, raising and caring for the puppy entails. Um, all right. What? Are you sick of that one already? Um, I have another puzzle toy here. Um, I'll bring it down to this camera here. Now this is, uh, this is by Kong. Kong is a really good brand and I will explain more about that in a bit. You can actually put treats right in there. And this might be a little tricky for her. She's never seen anything like this before, but she is a very inquisitive girl. So, let's see, but she's more interested in what I'm doing. And yeah, so toys, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of puzzle toys that can really engage your puppy's mind and get them thinking. So that is great. So we'll just watch her do that. Um, and talk more about this while she does that. Actually, I'm gonna put a different scene on here. Funny girl. Keep playing with it. Okay, so that's puzzles. And there's so many more puzzles that you can get too. Um, agility. Agility is a really good one. As I said before, it, um, it's good for the physical and mental stimulation of your puppy. Now, um, when you have a puppy, it's really important that you take it easy with the amount of exercise and the jumping and that kind of thing because they are still growing. But as they get older, like um, depending on the breed, um, once they're six months or older, you could really get them going a little bit more. But you can also get them doing like smaller things like little jumps or little ramps, just like different kinds of things. And it's really good for their socialization too to get them knowing more about, um, you know, different textures and that kind of thing. Boop, boop, boop. Problem solving. So yeah, I touched on that. Problem solving is really good for them. And um, puzzles are one way to do that. Um, but any kind of problem solving through like training or that kind of thing can be really good to help their mental stimulation. Now let's talk a little bit about dog breeds. Um, so there are seven breed groups, and um, each dog is classified under one of these groups. Now there are some, there, you may have some crossbreeds that are not in, like these are for purebreds, um, but you can get an idea from, uh, with um, the breeds that your dog has been crossed with as to what kind of energy levels they may have or um, you know what kinds of requirements they may have and that kind of thing you can never be a hundred percent sure with a crossbreed um, but you can get some ideas so there's seven groups we're going to talk a little bit about each of them um, and again yeah so the the difference is that each different breed was bred for specific purposes. So they may have been bred to herd sheep or to hunt or to guard the, the property and that kind of thing. And these will really, um, these kinds of things really change 
um, you know, what they, what kinds of characteristics they may have, what their temperament will be, um, and that kind of thing, as well as like their energy levels, because if you have a dog who is bred to hunt or you know, retrieve, they're going to have more energy than a dog who wasn't bred for those things. Whoops. Um, so yeah, their energy levels and exercise requirements vary um, depending on that. The ease of training, some breed groups were bred to work more closely with humans than others. Um, sociability, some dogs were bred to be more wary of strangers than others. Um, like if you compared a golden retriever with a Rottweiler, a golden retriever is bred to be more with humans and more kind of like a family dog, whereas a Rottweiler was bred to help protect. So they might be more wary of strangers than a golden retriever would be. Um, distractibility. So if you have a scent hound, they may not do very well at paying attention when they are when something really enticing catches their nose or a herding dog. Um, but we're going to talk more about the specifics as well. Um, and also I'd like to point out that um, the, the, there are generalizations made here. Whoops. Oh my God, sorry. <laughs> um, but in the end, each breed and each individual dog um, will be different as each individual dog is unique. Um, even within the same breed. So Huskies are notoriously very high energy, aloof dogs. But I met one a couple months ago who was actually the calmest and kindest dog ever. He, and he was just a pup too. Like he was just complete opposite of all the other Huskies that I have known. So it really varies. So I'm gonna to touch briefly on each of the breed groups and kind of what you expect with each of them. Um, so we have the sporting group. Um, so these are like your golden retrievers, your Labrador retrievers, um, and that kind of thing. Cocker Spaniels are very popular as well. These kinds of dogs are easily trained and they are eager to please their people. They are actually very popular in obedience competitions as well. Um, hold on here. I'm still figuring out how to multitask here. So forgive me for any weirdness in the stream as it is still my first stream. All right, so um, they are a devoted family pet. Um, some challenges that you may have with this kind of breed, they can be highly distractible and have higher energy levels. Um, but this just means, you know, more training um, under distractions can actually really help and making sure that they get all the exercise that they need each day is really important as well. Uh, the non-sporting group. So these dogs, you kind of have an assortment. It's a mixed group. Um, but most, for the most part, they were bred to make pets. They're, they're better pets because they were bred specifically to be lap dogs or just like house pets, companions. So they have a lot of traits bred into them that will make them better pets. Um, but because of that, they also may need more motivation in training. So keeping training more exciting can be really beneficial for these kinds of dogs. The working group. Um, so these are the kinds of dogs who may have been bred for um, like pulling sleds or uh, guarding and that kind of thing. So they can be very loyal dogs. They're very willing to work. Um, they do have higher energy, but um, the higher energy, like, you know, sufficient for their work. They can be territorial. As I said, some of these dogs were bred to be 
um, watchdogs and for protecting. So it really, um, that can really affect them there. Um, make them more territorial. They can be more independent as a lot of these breeds were kind of bred to work. They work with people, but they work on their own. Does that make sense? So like um, if you have a dog who is bred to guard, you're going to train them how to do this and what's expected, but they're going to be doing it on their own. So they kind of work within their own minds. Um, so you need to be work on your leadership skills a lot more with these kinds of dogs. And they can be stubborn and difficult to train because of this as well. But again, and I want to emphasize that every breed is going to have some challenges and every individual is going to have challenges. These are just some things to keep in mind when you're choosing your dog or when you're training your dog because these will really help you to understand what your dog needs. And then we have the herding group. Now these are virtually tireless dogs. It's very important to understand that. These dogs were bred to work, 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 and run, run, run. Um, so, but with that, because of their higher energy, they are very easily trained. They're very fast learners. Um, they can make really good watchdogs and they can be really attached to their people, which can be great if you want a nice close companion. But that the trade-off with that is they can also be very prone to separation anxiety. Um, whoopsie daisy. So that's something to keep in mind. And they also may bark a lot when they are excited. Um, just a, a breed trait with herding dogs. They tend to bark a lot more like that. Next is the hound group. So sight hounds. Um... The sight hounds are usually um, referred to as a couch potato dog because they don't have a lot of energy that they need to expend like every day. They have, um, like they of course, like sight hounds, you think a greyhound, they can run like 70 kilometers an hour, but they're not doing that all the time. Um, so they actually don't have as much energy as people think. Um, then you have your scent hounds, and scent hounds are, um, they tend to have more medium energy levels. And in general, these dogs, they are lower maintenance. Um, but some challenges you get with them, they can be easily distracted because of their heightened sense of um, sight and their scent. Um, they can be independent and they can be very picky with the weather because they don't have the long insulated coats that a lot of the other breeds do. And this means that in the winter they may get really cold and in the summer they may overheat very easily because they don't have that insulation. Um, so these dogs may need, if you live in cooler climates or hot climates, they may need... Um, protective clothing or um, blankets inside, especially greyhounds, like they just love to be blanketed. Terriers. Um, so terriers were bred to fight vermin. Because of this, they have very high energy. They're tenacious. They have a lot of digging instinct so they can get down into the tunnels where mice and rats may be. Um, they also are really fast learners because of the high energy, but these are some things to keep in mind. With this kind of dog, you may want to train them to work, um, to play in like digging pits and stuff. If they start, um, you know, digging up your yard, you could get a sandbox for them, um, that kind of thing. Okay, toy group. Now this is another mixed group. Um, the dogs here were mostly bred to be smaller so that they can be companions. So they are eager to please because they were bred to be pets. However, 
they are also very delicate as they are smaller their whole body structure is smaller more delicate um, and another thing too when you're training them you know there will be a lot more leaning over to you know give them treats and that uh, so something to keep in mind puppy education now um, this is something that's really important uh, to, to hold on. A puppy's education is really important because you they need to understand what is expected of them, what what the world is and what their role in the world is. So there's many different things that as an owner you need to be aware of and help to, teach your puppy so that they can be happy in your world. So teaching skills that help your puppy understand your world, how to live in it. So these are things like socialization, desensitization, and basic obedience, like sit, down, stay, uh, loosely schwalking, that kind of thing. These actually help to teach them how to communicate with you as well as um, help to teach them what is expected in different times and that kind of thing and uh, as I said it's very important it helps your puppy to be happy and comfortable in your world and it teaches many life-saving skills so you know being able to teach your dog to come when called can be life-saving if they run out the door um, and you have a busy street nearby, it's very important that you're able to call your dog back in case something like that happened. All right, positive reinforcement training. Um, so positive reinforcement training is very important. Um, what it is is rewarding desirable behaviors to increase their occurrence. So there's different reward types that we're going to talk about. Um, many of you probably already know about treats. Many dogs, for many dogs, treats are um, very rewarding. But there are some dogs who have different drives. Like uh, if your dog has a very strong food drive, they're going to love treats. But if they have a really strong prey drive, they may like training with toys better. Um, and another, other types of rewards are praise, petting, and attention. So if they have a really high social drive, they'll love that. And environmental, such as like walks or letting them sniff, letting them go outside, letting them play, that kind of thing. And you can use all of these reward types in positive reinforcement training. And it really just depends on what your dog likes and the situation like if uh, when I take my dog to the dog park I make him sit each time before he's allowed to go in off leash so he's giving me his attention he's letting me know okay like he'll do he'll be listening if I need him to and his reward for sitting before he goes in is getting off leash and getting to go play and do whatever he'd like in the dog park uh, dun, dun. Reward values. So within each of these, there's different values. So um, for example, with treats, you have your lower values, which would be kibble, and a higher value would be something like chicken or steak, something that is just so delicious that they can't help but just need it. Um, and then with toys too, they may have, um, they may like a ball better than a plush toy. Um, and it really depends on each dog. In general, like with treats, kibble is the lower end and chicken is your higher value. But it really depends. Every dog is different. Clicker and marker words. So when you're training, um, you can use a clicker, and I have one here. 
Let me just see if I can figure out what I'm doing here. Um, so this is a clicker. I mean, there's a picture on the screen too. Um, there's many different kinds of clickers. I like this one because it's got a nice button. It sounds nice. Um, and they make it sound like this. And basically you train your dog to um, know that when that sound is made, that means they've done something that you like and that a reward is coming. Um, a marker word is the same thing, except instead of a clicker, you're using your words. So my marker word to tell them that a reward is coming is yes. I'll say yes. Um, okay. And I use both of them depending on the situation. So I usually will use a marker word as I always have it with me, it's easier. But sometimes if I have a puppy or a dog who is having a hard time grasping a concept, then I will, um, hold on here. I will get the clicker and that way I can grab that quick moment where maybe they're giving me eye contact or something. And it can really help to speed along the process of the training. So these are just some things that you can keep in mind when with positive reinforcement training. All right, so let's just go over uh, what we went over. So we went over leadership over dominance. Um, leadership being um, way more positive than dominance. Um, dominance. Dominance theory really goes with the idea that fear and intimidation are the way to teach your dog. But really, if you invoke fear in your puppy, there's not going to be any learning. And so positive reinforcement training really focuses on that learning. Um, and leadership is part of being a positive role model for your dog. We went over mental and physical exercise and what kinds of things that you can do for your dog and the importance of it too, because many times um, as a dog gets older and people start noticing some behavioral issues, a lot of times it's because they aren't getting adequate exercise. Um, and I'll, you'll hear the phrase, a tired puppy is a happy puppy. And that is very true. So you give them all the exercise and the stimulation that they need and then you'll see right there, you'll get a puppy who just wants to snooze and be happy. It's wonderful. So we talked about some breed differences. And again, it's just to give you an idea of what they were bred for. And um, that gives you an idea of what their needs may be because of that. Puppy education and the importance of their education uh, we're going to talk more about what kinds of things they should be learning and how to teach them. Um, but this was just to give you an overview of the importance of that because they don't understand our world. So we have to help them to understand our world so that they can live comfortably in it. And finally, we talked about positive reinforcement training and what that means. Um, so, po and basically, um, if I didn't make that clear. I mean, I think it's fairly obvious, but maybe it's not. Um, positive reinforcement training basically means you're giving them a reward when they give you um, a behavior that you would like repeated. So if when you're training obedience commands like sit, they'll when you're training them sit, you give them a treat when they sit and they'll learn to associate, okay, well, sitting is good. It's a good thing. Um, all right, so next week we are going to talk about rewarding desirable behaviors. So not just with training and training obedience, but actually throughout the day. And that's something that many people forget is 
that throughout the day you can actually be rewarding your dog for things that they are doing on their own to tell them that this is very good, this is a good choice that you're making. Uh, we're also going to talk about routines and um, what a routine means for your dog. Consistency and training. Um, consistency is very important and we'll talk about why that's important. We're going to go deep into socialization and desensitization, what that is, um, what proper socialization is, because it's not what many people think it is. It's actually, um, it's a lot simpler than what people think it is, in my opinion. Um, desensitization, and that's something that's really important too, and we'll talk about why. We're going to talk about health. Um, so basically, we're going to talk about some vaccines that your dog will need um, for the first year and um, we're going to talk about how to choose a vet and how to um, we're going to also discuss pet insurance a little bit and finally we're going to talk about car safety and um, that's about how to keep your dog safe when you're transporting them anywhere in the car with you all right well, that's everything for today. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to let me know. Send me a message or uh, anything. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. Let me just see here. Um, holy shit, this is bad. <laughs> um... Let me try that again. We'll pretend you didn't see that. So, um, this isn't how that works, is it? Um, yeah, so follow me on Instagram. I will be posting more on my Instagram as time goes by. This is my first stream, so I'm just getting into things and um, figuring things out. If you have any suggestions about what you would like to see um, more of in the streams or um, anything at all, I may or may not have a suggestions box below the stream. Let me just do that. Um, so you can put your suggestions in there or you can message me. I'd love to hear what you thought and what you would like to see. What does this do? Yeah, so that's what we're gonna talk about next week. Um, what else can I talk about? Um, bum, bum, bum. Oops, does this go like that? No, don't mind me while I just mess up my screen here. Um, you can also visit my website and I will have some more resources on the website. You can look up the Pre-Puppy Live class and it'll outline when my streams are for this class. Um, and also give you some more information and some resources that will help you when your training comes to be. Um, anyway, I'd like to thank you for watching. And again, any questions, any comments, leave them in my suggestion box on the stream, message me. Um, you can also message me or email me on my website. And again, that's right here. Um, all right.